Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Madison. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And thanks to all of you for taking time out of your evening uh, to come um, here about some political philosophy. That's my first warning. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a political, I'm a political philosopher, and I'm going to um, lay some political philosophy on you. I'm going to do it in a way that I hope will not be painful. It may be most painful to those of you who have a political philosophy, um, but hopefully even you by the end will be, um, will be okay. So uh, here it goes. Um, for many years, for decades, the terrain of liberal theorizing, that is the terrain over which political philosophers in the academy argue about the free society or what liberalism requires, or what democracy retire, requires. For decades, the terrain of liberal theorizing has lain in a deep freeze. And as I picture it, that, terrain, that academic terrain resembles a, um, an ocean, or at least a bay, frozen, wind blowing across the icy tops, little tufts of snow. Off one side, we have camps on both sides. Off one side, off one coast, we have the embattled camp of the libertarians and classical liberals. Some of you. <laughs> As I picture, me too. As I picture that, tent, that camp, they're hunkered down on the ice in their tents with the winds blowing against the doors, flapping at the doors. But they've got some stakes that they've stuck into the ice really deep through the years. They pound in the men and those tents ain't going nowhere. They can take the wind, but it's still blowing pretty hard out there, and it's rough uh, in the tent. Out there in that, in that tent of classical liberals and libertarians, they defend limited government and strong economic liberties, especially private economic liberties of capitalism. In that camp, in those tents, the phrase social justice is never or only dismissively her contemptuously, perhaps. This is the philosophical group that provides intellectual foundations to, I don't know, Ron Paul certainly, but maybe more generally um, in, the, in America, the, the Tea Party. There's also a Japanese Tea Party, interestingly. Across the cove, on the other side, is the academically dominant camp. This is the camp of the modern or egalitarian, or as they like to call themselves, the high liberals. I like that name, I'm gonna give it to him. This is the academic dominant camp. I suppose it's, uh, they've got igloos, well-made igloos, blocked together by this guy named John Rawls, typically. And in those igloos, it's warm, they have heaters, they have furs, no doubt, thrown around. Faux furs, I'm sure. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a luxurious camp, and in this camp, they, their battle cry in this camp is social justice, or if you like, social justice now. They advocate an expan a government of expansive powers, especially in economic <coughs> affairs. They're highly skeptical of the moral importance of individual economic liberty. And they are deeply skeptical of the patterns of distributions that result from the exercise of those private economic liberties. They are the, this is the group, the academically ma academic mainstream that gives firepower to groups like Occupy London and other places too. This dispute, uh, here comes the philosophy a little bit. This dispute between these two camps is not merely institutional. That institutional dispute, big government, small government, social justice, economic liberty, is reflective of a deeper dispute, a philosophical dispute, a foundational dispute about where political philosophy should begin. And in particular, it's a dispute about at least two rival conceptions of moral personality. And I sort of sketch it up on the board. I mean, it's kind of pathetically drawn out, but um, I don't know. Adam Smith Institute is, is too uh, classy to let me use my PowerPoints, so they'd make me do this. <laughs> this is the, that's the cost of style. You get no style. <laughs> so by, 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 liberta by liberta so they're libertarians. By libertarians, I mean people like Ayn Rand, Murray Rothbard, um, Robert Nozick. These are people who affirm economic liberty is as something like moral absolutes. Their reasoning tends to be naturalistic. So that's their, that's their politics. This is the school. This is the politics. This is the conception of the person. This school now, uh, their politics, as I said, they emphasize economic liberty as the most important of all rights, perhaps the only right, some, some libertarians say. Freedom of speech, according to Jan Narvison, means it requires the ability to own your mouth. So even that is a <laughs> right. 
And it's rooted in this idea of a person as a self-owner. And this is an idea of politics that comes all, it's rooted all the way back to Locke. So Locke, as many of you know, had this idea that how do we think about politics? How do we st start to think about what the state should do or shouldn't do? How do we figure out what the boundaries of state power should be? And Locke suggested, well, maybe we should think about ourselves without the state. Maybe we should think about ourselves in a state of nature and ask, and ask, well, what's a person like in the state of nature? What can we see about the way we were created and what God meant for us from that observation? And Locke said that um, in the state of nature, Men are, we see that men are created free and equal by God, or free and equal children of God. And strikingly, Locke thought, we know this one thing about people in the state of nature, at least, they own themselves. Each one owns himself. And then you know the rest, right? Owning yourself, you own your labor too. If you own your labor, you can mix your labor with things out there in the wild and come to own those things. And thus property rights can arise naturally in the state of nature. When it comes to, to it comes time to get together to make a state, therefore, we know already what the role of the state should be, or at least one part, important role the state should be. The state is appropriate only if it protects these natural rights. So government is limited by the requirement that it not trespass upon the property rights of self-owning individuals. And a government which tries to take things away from people and redistribute to other people against those people as well is violating their natural property rights. It's stepping on the feet of those self-owners. And they say, get off my feet. Don't do that to my property. That's the libertarian view. That's the dominant view of free market thinking in any academy. When most people in the academy talk about a free market view, they want to talk about Nozick. He's like their, their, prim their primary champion. It's worth noting, though, many of you, I think, at least people uh, who are interested in Adam Smith, there's another tradition that's also a free market tradition, uh, classical liberalism. It's an older tradition. It's a broader one. It's less philosophically rigorous. Maybe until now. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> by classical liberals, I mean, you know, the great granddaddy is Adam Smith. Uh, yeah, I'd say Smith. Um, but uh, people like Frederick Hayek, um, Milton, Milton Friedman, uh, Richard Epstein, there are others. They also affirm property rights, but with a, this is meant to be a capital P, but with a strong, a big P, but they don't see property as the only, it's not absolutes for them. It's really important. But people in the classical liberal tradition allow the property can be truncated in various ways. For example, to support a, a, safe, a social safety net, to protect people in extreme, extreme want, or perhaps to provide support, public support for schooling in some form or other. And they're behind their view. They tend to be economists, or economic, economistic forms of reasoning. They think about consequences. And, they, and the basic view is something like a the conception of a person as a happiness seeker or utility maximizer. And the just society is a society organized in such a way that will maximize efficiency, produce, <coughs> maximize productivity, and thus they think, for a variety of reasons, economic liberty should be given a very heavy weight and government should be limited. Now, across the sea from them, as I said, is a different school. This is the academically dominant school. This is the school of the high liberals. And the paragon here is John Rawls, great theorist of liberal justice. And they argue for social justice. And their reasoning, they say, look, how should we start politics? Instead of thinking we should begin with John Locke's conception of the state of nature, they begin with something like a Rousseauian, Rousseauian slash Kantian conception of the person that, of the person as a democratic citizen. So their politics, they said when we start thinking we should probably should organize a society, they say we should start this way. Start by asking, what is a democratic citizen? What would it mean to be a political agent among other, living with other political agents. And roughly they have two ideas about the characteristic of this democratic citizen. First, the democratic citizen is a person, each democratic citizen is, is a person who has a life of her own to lead. So every person has a life, has a plan of life, and that plan of life is incredibly important to that person. Second, along with conceiving of citizens as people who have their own lives to lead, they also conceive of citizens as people who are incapable of recognizing their fellow citizens as also as beings who have their lives to lead. And those lives are incredibly important to each of them. So they think that you have to build politics from this moral idea of citizenship, where a citizen, one, has a life to lead and sees the importance of it, but also, two, sees that his fellow citizens have lives to lead and know these are, those lives are important to them, too. That conception of the citizen generates a certain principle of legitimacy that says something like this. The use of state power is legitimate 
only if it's conducted on the basis of principles that people subject to that power can themselves accept. What? It means, <laughs> it means uh, when we organize society, whatever structure we come up with is not going to be justified by asking whether it matches up to natural requirements of natural rights. Rather, it's going to be justified by asking, well, is this the kind of social structure, all things considered, that every citizen subject to that power could say yes to? And that way of thinking about politics naturally generates or runs us toward a conception of morality or social justice, a conception of, of institutions that makes social justice primary. So that's a big divide. You can see that that distinction between, this is the point of all that, this debate between the advocates of property rights and the advocates of social justice is not just one about which things get us someplace first better. It is fundamentally a moral dispute, a dispute about which conception of moral personality is the correct one. And because the dispute goes back to these different ways of thinking about moral personality, that's why the wind that blows across the divide cuts out the conversation so much. Every now and then, I should say, you know, the people who see this most dramatically typically are graduate students. When graduate students arrive on the scene, this frozen scene for the first time at the moral status quo, they sort of you know, see these two, they say, there's, my, there's the power people over there in the academy, there's the embattled band over there, and they get to choose which way they want to go. Um, those of them, graduate students like, I, like me, who are drawn to the idea of economic liberty, would find themselves um, uh, taken up on, mushed, mushed over on, on dog sleds in the direction of these tattered camps, a dog sled that in my case was provided for by the Institute for Humane Studies. Those other groups that do the similar kind of funding of these <laughs> rickety but important structures. And as, as I was mushed over to that camp, I was at least as I got close, allowed to decide which of the two tents I wanted to hide out in myself. I chose the classical liberal one, it was slightly warmer, but you know, it was tough, trust me. <laughs> the other, others, most grad students though, arriving on the scene and seeing the power structures as they are, and also feeling that they feel the draw of this. They sort of see this, everyone's talking about this. They feel the moral power of that idea. And they find themselves whisked off, I don't know, by high-powered snow machines with heated seats, up, 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 to the camp of the high liberals. And there they have a great time talking with each other. And, but across the divide, not much happens at all. Every now and then, someone will come out of one of the tents and say, you lot over there. You democratic citizens, don't you see that you're really self-owners and people are enslaving you by taking their property? But all the other, on the other side here is <laughs> what? And vice versa. So because the debate's rooted in different conceptions of the person, the debates are fixed, there's no common ground. We're forced into the dichotomies. Economic liberty or social justice. Capitalism or democracy. Hayek or Rawls the Tea Party, or Occupy, free markets, or fairness. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Um, my idea started with my strong attraction to property rights for first personal reasons about my family's experience, but also just for my own, for my own reading. I was convinced long ago about the importance of economic liberty, especially the importance of economic liberty as a moral value. The moral value of people making lives for themselves is something that I'm absolutely committed to. On the other hand, I gotta tell you, I kinda like this. Kinda like it. Something about the idea that we aim a little higher, we think of our fellow citizens having lives that are important and taking that on board. I kinda like that, but I was always told, look, don't talk about that, because if you do that, you're gonna give up this, and they're gonna be jammed onto that, which I definitely didn't want. <laughs> so that's sort of the way you know, that we, we have these debates as philosophers, well, which do we think is the appropriate conception of the person, but we all know in the background that whichever way you come out in that philosophical dispute, you're going to be slammed with an ideology. So my idea is to, as a classical liberal, build a kind of an icebreaker and chug my way across the divide, busting up the ice as I go, and I come down here and I cross over, and I bump into the idea of the democratic citizen, and I bump it hard. And when I bump into it, I try to break up the ground beneath those little warm igloos of theirs, those cozy spots they've been talking with each other about for so long, and try to encourage people to expand the conversation. If the commitment here 
is sincerely to talk about what it means to respect one another as free and equal self-governing agents, well then let's have that conversation. But let's have it now with some people who don't all happen to share this ideological conviction that property rights are not important, or that property is morally bad in some way. What if we had the same conversation they meant to be having all these years, but now include some other voices who don't see things that way? And then begin the argument over again with a wider range, range of people having democratic arguments with them. And I think when you start doing that, a couple of things happen and you ask some new questions. First, is deliberative democracy really a vehicle that can only make left turns? And most important, do we really best respect our fellow citizens as free and equal self-governing <coughs> authors of their own lives by seeking to use the state to restrict their private economic liberties? So I developed a theory of liberal justice that I call free market fairness that tries to combine those uncombinables. It combines democracy and capitalism, Rawls and Hayek, Occupy and the Tea Party, free markets and fairness. And the view, just to schematize it is, I call it market democratic, and it affirms social justice, oops, and <coughs> property, actually property first, but and it affirms the democratic citizen. Same one these guys have. We're happy together now. <laughs> well, I am. So how do you do that? How do you, if you have this ambition <laughs> to think about uh, the democratic society, but are interested in property rights, committed to the importance of property rights, how do you get an argument for social justice that combines these two things? There's two problems. One. You need an argument for property rights, for strong property rights, that doesn't use the old tricks. You need a strong argument for property rights that does not rely upon consequentialist co claims about how markets work, at least not on the first level. You also need a moral argument that does not rely upon naturalistic claims about self-ownership that a lot of people find controversial and unlikely. You need instead a democratic argument for property rights, an argument for property rights based on the idea of what respect citizens owe to one another. And then, Along with that, you need an account of social justice, of distributive justice, of a, a sort of society that will be acceptable to all citizens, all working citizens at least, that is compatible with the restricted government now you're going to have in a society that affirms strong property rights. So you've got to have a democratic government for property rights, and you've got to have um, an, a conception of social justice that's compatible with strong economic liberties and limited government. How can you do it? Well, for my libertarian friends, I have an unusual place to start. And you might think I'm promising. Oops. Don't fall off. <laughs> OK. So how do you get that? This is how I do it. There's a conception of justice called justice is fairness. And here's one form. There's many formulations, but here's, here's one of my favorite formulations of it. We should regard, so again, we're trying to decide, how do we think about justice? How do we think how we should or organize our society? And instead of thinking naturalistically, a la Locke, this is another way to think about it. We think, well, maybe we could find a way to model our commitment to fairness. Is there some decision thought process or uh, frame of mind we could use, a thought experiment, that might help us figure out what principles of justice would be appropriate if we really want our society to be fair? And here's a formulation of that. Quote, we should regard as the most desirable social order the one which we would choose if we knew that our initial position in it would be, de be determined by chance, such as the chance of our being born into a particular family." Close quote. That's a conception of social justice that has some moral attractions. Let me just show them to you for a moment. Just pause for a moment. The idea is that if you imagine parties in an, in an original choosing position, not knowing who they are, but with a kind of veil in front of their eyes, making them ignorant about who in particular they're going to be in that society, what social status they're going to be standing, holding themselves, then we might think, well, what size of society should we have? What's the society that would be appropriate for anyone now? You could be any person in that society. And if you could run the thought experiment that way, you could get principles of justice that would probably model fairness. You might think to yourself, look, this is a social world. I feel really, let's say I feel really lucky. So I want a social world where there's incredible inequalities. So I just feel lucky today. And I feel like, you know, I'll beat the top. I'll get born on top for sure. But since it's a choice for your life, 
your prob the decision rule is argued, but the decision rule probably is a little more conservative. If you're making a choice for a social structure behind that veil, you're probably going to choose a more conservative decision procedure, one which makes you want to pay special attention to the working poor. There are some people who don't try at all, we'll set them aside, but people who work and try, if you're one of those people at least, you probably think to yourself, well, I probably want to do as well as possible. So the idea is that if you look at a bunch of different candidate institutions, socialism, capitalism, social democracy, the welfare state, whatever it might be, you ask yourself, well, which one of those social systems, and which one of those social systems might the least well-off people, workers, do the best? And that would be the most just one. I'm just curious, I'm not sure how many of you do political philosophy or, or philosophy junkies, but does any of you happen to know uh, which philosopher wrote this when and when where? Do you know? Is it from political liberalism rules? So there's this guy named John Rawls that I mentioned before. <laughs> who wrote a book called A Theory of Justice in 1971, where he developed this famous left-wing argument for social justice. It's the left, and it's all about the original position and the veil of ignorance. But this ain't by John Rawls. This ain't from 1971, and it ain't from America. This was, this was an idea first formulated, so far as I know, in uh, 1940 in London at the LSE by F A I N. <laughs> so, some of you may know, some of you may know this brilliant book by F.A. Hayek called The Mirage of Social Justice, where he is, it's one of the best attacks on social justice. If you're looking for snowballs to throw at the high liberals, as I, for years, loved, enjoyed doing, that's like one of the best stacks of snowballs against social justice you can find. If you haven't read it, I just highly recommend, I think it's one of Hayek, maybe it's his best book. I, I love that book. It's called The Mirage of Social Justice. In that book, though, interestingly, Hayek says two really curious things. He says, one curious thing we care about here. He says, so in the midst of a book, late in the book, um, on, on the Rawls of Social Justice, he says, by the way, but you know this guy Rawls? He and I agree on the basic idea of justice. What? On page 100, on, on volume two of Law, Legislation, and Liberty, on page 100, at around footnote 18, there's a couple footnotes, but around, around footnote 18, he says this. What? How can that be? What's more, Hayek tells this incredible story, fascinating story, some of you may know, that he was at that time in London during the bombing, and he began to fear for the lives of his children. And so he began thinking about himself, about sending his children abroad. So he sent letters out to various countries around the world to friends saying, would you take my kids? Because I need to get them out of here. He started thinking about that, and he reports he started thinking to himself, well, in fact, this is kind of an interesting thought experiment. And what's more, he began to realize he might be killed, he was likely to be killed himself, which meant that his children would be not have the protection of, an, of an, a prominent academic to sort of give them social status. I mean, Hayek was not a prominent academic yet. He was you know, still doing the wonderful stuff beneath the radar. He became prominent, but maybe he had, maybe he had hope, faith in himself. Anyway, so he thought to himself, I should not even know, you know what family I'd live in. He added these sort of thick in the information filters, so just the way Rawls would much later do. And Hayek says that that got him thinking about justice, and he fell on, he created something that I tell, I'll tell my students at Brown is appropriately called the original, original position, thus making Rawls's position forevermore the unoriginal position. <laughs> um, but then we have to ask, right? If we reason this way, if we adopt Hayek's idea of the original position and start reasoning about markets, committed to economic liberty for varieties of reasons, interested also, no doubt, in the powers of spontaneous order, right? You can't be doing Hayek's justice without spontaneous order. What do you get? What, do you, what, what does it yield? What kind of principles do you get to? In particular, which rights do you get out of it? And second, what distributions of goods would be acceptable? Let me answer both those questions briefly. So for behind the veil, people need to decide they have the veil of ignorance. They need to decide what rights and liberties they have. When you do that, excuse me, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of technical stuff that you need to do, but we'll let that be. That's, you know, it's in, in the last chapter of the book, there's a whole bunch of technical stuff for the Rawlsians. I couldn't resist giving it to them full force. Um, but you have to figure out what liberties are important. Historically, classical liberals, people in the liberal tradition, had thought that economic liberties were one of the most important rights and liberties of citizens. So it was always, for, for Smith, for the founders of America, it's always been, it was just obvious that property rights are among the most important liberties that people have, right up alongside 
religious liberty, freedom of speech. Property rights were considered in, Ameri in the American context the guardian of every other right. They were thought to be enormously important, and obviously, as we as any of the other um, basic rights and liberties. That way, often, obviously, this is from the English heritage, uh, sort of popped up on our, on our shores. But, and so these liberties, these economic kind of liberties involve the rights to independent economic activity, powerful liberties of working and of owning, were thought to be a basic part of freedom. And yet, starting, I think, with John Stuart Mill in the 1850s, a certain uncertainty, a kind of uncertainty, crept into the minds of some liberals. And that uncertainty started to grow. And as it grew, we started getting this big divide within liberal thought. Um, and with Mill, for example, Mill thought that those liberties of, economic, those liberties of a private independent activities, applying for a job, getting rejected. Applying for another job, getting rejected again. Going out there, despite all that, applying again and getting a job. Going in there, being told what to do. Being told what to do, but then doing it well, getting a raise. Saving some money because of things in the future. Saying no to things you want to do now because you're worried about what you want to do in the, in the, in the, in the future. Having ambitions for oneself. Trying to get ahead. Talking to your children about them getting ahead. Making something of yourself. Struggling, striving, failing, succeeding, risking things. All those, those economic activities, no thought, were not essential parts of the good life for human beings. That kind of stuff, maybe you need it, so you can go off and you know, write logic, books about logic and so on, but those activities themselves are not part of a fully human life. So too, and even more dramatically, John Maynard Keynes, in writing in 1930, wrote this brilliant short essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. Whatever you think of Keynesian economics, I highly recommend that you read his brilliant, beautiful short essay, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. It is the best quick insight into the mind of the left, the moral mind of the left. In that short essay, Keynes says, look, it's a very time a very bad economic, it's a very bad time economically, obviously. But Keynes says, look, you guys, in a hundred years, by the time his grandkids are around, Western societies will have grown economic economies would have grown about eight times. Now growth economics hadn't even really got going yet. I and mean, my economist friends tell me that that's not a not a bad guess. It's kind of a remarkable guess. In fact, we are probably eight to ten times richer than they were back then. Crucially though, Keynes says, that by the time we grow, you know, eight times or so, by 2030 or say now, we will have, the economic problem will have been solved. And once the economic problem had been solved, happy day. We now can finally look at those bourgeois virtues and recognize them for the vices that they always were. They hag rode us for a thousand years, he says. But now, we can put them aside. We can see that those things I talked about are actually vices, not virtues. And indeed, Keynes calls them morbid neuroses, and says that people who still have them should be assigned to, men assigned to mental institutions, forcibly, no doubt. So Lord Keynes looked down his long nose at these activities, these, every these everyday libertarian attitudes that are so common among working people in all liberal societies, so dear to working people, who have ambitions, who care about their families, who care about doing something for themselves to move their families forward, who are not content merely to be given things, but rather who want things because of their own striving, who want to talk to their children and show their children by example what it means to make oneself, make a mark for oneself in the world. Those attitudes, in the economic sphere at least, Lord Keynes thought little of. So too John Rawls, 1971, and the theory of justice, takes the list of basic rights and liberties from behind the veil and says we would choose only a very, very thin, scalpel-down conception of economic liberty. For example, there are only two, he thinks, a right to personal property, no right to pro productive property. Liberalism now is compatible with socialism. You don't, need, you don't even need to have productive property. You don't even have, you have capital. You can have socialism and still have liberal freedom. And a right to occupational choice, which means the ability to choose which occupation you pursue in a sort of a very thin way but no right at all to choose the terms of your occupation, no right at all to decide how many hours you're gonna work a week, no right at all to decide how much you'll accept for your, for your, for your labor. Those decisions are gonna be taken away from people and, and instead de de decided for them by the collective. My argument in the book kind of looks at that idea, that, that those moral arguments, and I try to analyze those moral arguments. And one of the things that I, that I, 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 I mess around with and use and, and, and think about is this prediction that was so common among progressives of the last century, 
Um, Keynes is, is, a, is the model exemplar, but there are others, many others, Titmus, many others um, who had these ideas, the beverage too, who said they thought that they believed, these early progressives, that as, soci as societies became wealthier and wealthier, people, ordinary people, would come to care less and less about their private economic liberties. And yet, something like the opposite seems to have happened. As societies have grown wealthier, generally speaking, much wealthier, dramatically wealthier than they were 100 years ago, people still seem to resent high taxes. Not just rich people, but ordinary people. In America, it's common that many of the people who are really opposed to the move towards a regime of high taxes are the working, are the working poor. Not the destitute without work, we don't want to work, but the working poor often stubbornly resist, cling to their flag and their idea of the American dream. Why do they resist taxes? Why do ordinary people have this resistance to the, the progressive programs? Well, one answer, a convenient one for people on the left, is that they're greedy and they're morally wrong. After all, <laughs> well, no, right, but it's not, it's, you know, see where it comes from, right? If you do the thought experiment and you crank out a moral argument for social justice, a conception which gives very little place for economic liberty, then you find these people, these uneducated people, these working people, who resist the prescriptions, the calls to make our society more just. Well, they're morally wrong. They haven't read Rawls. Come on, you can't take their views seriously. There's something to that, I think. There are you know, people sometimes do resist taxation because they're greedy, but maybe there's something else going on too. Maybe there's a moral insight in those attitudes of ordinary working people. Maybe they know something about their lives that we philosophers should attend to. After all, the commitment of democratic theorists, supposedly, is to find systems that everyone can agree to, that every class of citizens should have input to. Some classes of citizens may have insights about the moral importance of work that some elites don't have or have lost. So I try to show not just because of what the polls say, but as a matter of political philosophy, that among the Basic among the rights that would be chosen in original position is uh, what, what I call thick, a thick conception of economic, a private economic liberty. The next part, part two, <laughs> need an account of distributive justice. And there's a little, there's a technical point, a small technical point. It will sound kind of strange to you, but it's really important and it's not that hard. So I'm going to lay it on you anyway. Um, there's a question: What is it? that a theory of distributive justice applies to. That is, what's a theory of justice, a theory of social justice, a theory, of just, a, a theory about? So a theory of justice, a theory of social, a thing we're behind the veil, we sort of work out this conception of basic rights and liberties, which includes economic liberties now. We're also going to need to get some conception of what distributions there should be, the distributor principle. Well, so we've got this ruler now, this yardstick we've figured out philosophically. Now the question I'm asking is, well, what out there exactly is this, is this yardstick of justice a property of? Here's the wrong answer, but it's, a, it's an attractive one to people on the left, but it's wrong. Left, people on the left agree. You might say, you should take the this, this, this measuring stick and apply it to the actual patterns of distributions in the society at any given moment. On that view, justice is a property of particular distributional patterns. So on that view, you would take a snapshot, click, of the UK today, or of the US today. Take a snapshot of who, what the whole things are. Sort of, you know, who knows what, right? Some of this, a lot of this, you know. Do the snapshot, you graph it out. Then you say, ah, oh, my yardstick, and I apply it to that. Let's see if it's just or unjust. For a whole variety of technical reasons, that approach to social justice has no solution. It has no solution for technical reasons, like I said, but it also is worrying for moral reasons. For example, and most obviously, if you think justice is a property of particular distributions, that means that the yardstick gets pulled out every, every, Monday, every morning at 8 a.m. by the state and slapped across society. Anything that happened the day before in the afternoon, choices people made, decisions they did with their money, decisions not to work, whatever it might be, anything they decide to do as human beings living their lives would disrupt the pattern in various ways. Therefore, the state needs to go in every day and correct it on moving back again. So if you use justice to apply to particular distributions, you're gonna have the state constantly interfering with people's lives on a daily basis, maybe an hourly basis, who knows? That's one, a moral reason, but there's also two more technical reasons. So instead, 
Rawls argues in his early papers before, before theory of justice, that justice is a property not of particular distributions, rather social justice is a property of institutions viewed holistically over time. So that yardstick that we get out of the theory applies not to you know, what you got and what I got and what people have got, but it applies rather to the whole social economic system that we live within. And we compare rival institutional forms, socialistic ones that are committed, say, to slow growth, as some of them are, the ones that Mill and Rawls, and the one that Mill, Hayek, sorry, scratch that, the one that Mill, Keynes, and Rawls uh, emphasizes their ideals were relatively slow growth economies. They thought they'd have the, the good of worker, workplace, worker owners, work, workers owning the workplaces, workplace ownership. Or to have a fast growing capitalist economy. What economy, you know, look at the whole structure and decide, well, which one of those realizes social justice? It's a really important point. That book I described by Frederick Hayek, the book I mentioned, The Mirage of Social Justice, is whatever it is, 230 page attack on social justice as applied to particular distributions. That one paragraph in the book, two, there's two paragraphs, where he says, hey, but I like social justice if it's applied to, if it's applied to the whole structure. That's when he's talking about what, I'm, what, what is the mainstream view of social justice. So if you think about this, justice as applied to particular distributions, it yields, obviously yields, an incredibly large intervention estate. But now, notice, if you use justice the way Rawls does, and apply justice to the thing that Rawls and Hayek think it should be applied to, it's suddenly now an open question. What kind of institutional form might thus realize some commitment to set things up in a way that even the lowest paid workers could agree to. And now we can start playing the game. Now we can start bringing in some insights, perhaps from Smith and others, about which social system over time might win that prize. So here's two formulations of social justice and I'll get to the end. Here's Rawls's. Rawls says that a society is just, that once you protect, protect the basic rights and liberties, though for him, of course, he has very few economic liberties on the list because he wants a big government to be able to do these things. A society is just, the society is just if, it max, if it maximizes the benefits that can be earned by the lowest paid workers. So the justice side is going to maximize the benefits to the least well off. Hayek says, slightly differently, more like a guy named John Harsani later, of course, if Hayek was earlier than him. Hayek said, the justice side is the one which maximizes the probability that each person can use his own information and in successfully to pursue projects of his own, of his own device, of his own devising. So it maximizes the probability that every person can use their own information to achieve their desired ends. Free market fairness, the view I work out in the book, has these two features then, all derived from this idea of a democratic citizen. First, that if we care about one another as democratic citizens, we have to include on the list of, on the list of basic rights and liberties a powerful set of rights of capitalism. These are among the most important <coughs> rights that we owe to, as, a, as a matter of respect to our fellow citizens. That greatly constrains that moral requirement that we not boss people around, even for their own good in the, in, the, in the economic domains of their lives. That moral requirement greatly constrains the thing that a democratic government can do in the, in the realm of, of economic life. And second, my view is that the most just society, holistically examined through time, maybe over a generation or two, as, a, as, as part of his natural functioning, is one which maximizes the benefits of, which maximizes the bundle of material wealth personally controlled with the lowest paid workers. So the society that would, in its ideal form at least, maximize the bundle of wealth privately controlled by people, now they have the rights to use them as they want, that would be the most just society. And I'll close just with this. Um, there are, it's a common view um, in America, and perhaps it's common in some quarters in, in Britain too, that to make a, a, a liberal society or a capital, uh, an erstwhile capitalist society more just, more socially just, would mean to enact policies and work to make those societies ever more like the European social democracies. But if you care about social justice, if you care about these moral principles and that moral ideal, then the star that we should see off in the sky and sort of steer by to make our societies more socially just resides over there and in, in the, uh, in, uh, above, above Norway somewhere, or above Sweden perhaps. I see the power of that, but I see the moral defects of it too. I think there's another ideal of social justice, equally attractive if not more so, an ideal that 
is, was found in, once upon a time at least, in, in this in a vivid form, in traditional American values, in an ideal of a society, whether it was a dream or a real, I don't know, but it was a dream and a vision at least, that, that it once stirred people from around the world. The idea that you can go to a place and through your own work, you can be celebrated for your hard work, you can care about your family and try to get them ahead and no one will criticize you for that, that you'll be independent and responsible for your life, that you'll make something of yourself because of who you are and who you want to be, and that that, that process is an essential part of dignity. That's an ideal of social justice of, based on opportunities for all people who are willing to work. That's an ideal of social justice that I think is equally, if not more, morally appealing than the social democratic one. So I call my book Free Market Fairness, but I don't mind if people call it, give it a less formal name, um, call it Social Justice American Style. Thank you. <laughs>